Whoa, showtime. Exactly. All right, so I'm Dan Galpin, and I'm a developer advocate with Android Games. And I'm, oh. With me I, is. <laughs> with me, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's, I'm Ko Kim. I'm part of the Google Play business development team focused on games. And we're here, we're here to, to level up, up your Android, Android game. game. Oh, yeah. So thank you for joining us at the very last session of the day here. We're hope, we'll hope we can keep you awake until the big party tonight. So we get a lot of questions. OK, and, and uh, let's, let's go over those first. You can hear, actually, I think they're rehearsing next door, that loud noise. It's like, so how do I get discovered is one question. How do I get featured? How do I get five stars? How do I get rid of bad ratings? How do I make users play my game? How do I make users buy stuff? And that's a lot of questions. But sometimes these questions miss a fundamental point. And at that point, in the center of everything, there is a user. And we like users. I mean, they're fascinating. Baffling. Maybe quite baffling creatures. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to answer those questions up, up there, we're focused on what's really important, which is that guy. And it's really not, and we'll give you our not so secret formula. And it's all about like what odds are is how do you make money rather than how do you, or basically help you increase the probability of getting featured on Google yeah. Play. Exactly. Happy users, more users, that's the way you're ultimately going to be successful. So, let's start by covering what you already know. Okay, last year we came out here, actually uh, Ian and I came out here last year, um, and Ian, Ian's mysteriously vanished and been replaced by Co. And, Sorry, uh, he was abducted by aliens and they have performed some experiments and out came me, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we, we talked about something we're very excited about, 10 things game developers should know. And the great thing is between last year and this year, we've actually taken those things and we've codified them, we've put them up on developer .com. In fact, I could stop right here and just say, click distribute and click app quality, okay? It's super, super important. And here's why. Because there's a lot of things game developers are still getting wrong. And this means that our QA team has to spend more time reviewing stuff, sending cycles back to developers saying, please change this or please change that. So an example is navigation. We've been telling developers for years, make sure the back button works. Don't put on-screen prompts on there. But people still do it. And not only that, if you don't support the back button, it leads to bad reviews. Users say, wait, they click, and they click, and they click, and nothing happens. They're like, I don't, I don't understand. I've been trained by every other app to do this, and it doesn't work. And so that's very important. There's also other buttons on the phone. Make sure the volume controls work. That's some, some ones that some people still miss. And also, our QA team really hates seeing that vestigial menu button there at the bottom. They'll say, no, no, take it away. And it's really, really easy to take it away. You just say, I'm going to use the latest version of Android. And that's really cool for a lot of reasons. One, it means you're actually testing on the latest version of Android, which is really cool. We like that. And two, it actually means that that menu button will go away. So get rid of it. Um, if you really, really want to have it there, make sure that it has a really important function, but you'll still have to explain to our review team like why you really need to have it there in your game. All right, so let's go to our next topic everyone gets wrong. Notifications. Oh, geez. Spammy <laughs> notifications are really, really awful, and I'm not even going to put up an example here because everyone knows this. Notifications should not be something that's an ad for something else, okay? So notifications should be something that are controllable by the user. In fact, the best thing you can do is make it, if you're going to do a lot of notifications, give the user precise control. Say, you know what? I don't want a notification between the hours that I might be asleep. Cool. Yeah. Or, 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 or when you're in an important meeting or when, like, I don't know, sometimes you're like, you know, like when you're on a date, that's kind of like or, when you or, hear the whole bing. Well, yeah, well, not only that, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of notifications say, you know what, I'm going to play a custom sound, okay? Well, I want my notifications from things that are really important to play sounds and from games actually just make it a little bit quieter. Otherwise, I'm going to turn them off in the OS because now we allow support for that. So it actually helps you out to do this as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll get bad reviews. Okay. Last year, we talked about all the things that you shouldn't ask for in terms of permissions, okay? You are a game, okay? You are not an operating system. Um, and there's a really, really good chance that you don't need to know the user's bookmarks. You don't need to know things like their fine location. Unless you are a location-based game and you need to know the user is standing right here, use course location. Um, 
there, uh, you shouldn't actually have to, uh, like you know. Like call phone number? That's kind of. You can use it, you can use no. an intent to call phone numbers, okay? Right. It's, if you really, really need to, you don't need a permission to actually, why would you directly call them, okay? Displaying system level alerts, unless you absolutely need to display something on the screen when you're not running and you have to justify that to our, to our review team, you're never gonna get featured if you have some of these bad permissions. And then finally, SMS. Is just is just awful because you can actually bill the user for things without them knowing it potentially. So don't don't do it. Okay. Who uses SMS anymore? Really? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I use Hangouts all the time. Perfectly fine. Right. right? right. Exactly. So we've also talked in the past a lot about audio. Okay because audio should not play when the screen is off. Audio should not play when their home screen. Audio should not play when you're not in the game. And this is really bad, because you're in a business meeting and suddenly you're giving this big presentation, you've got your suit on, so clearly you don't work at Google, and, uh, and suddenly you know, music comes out of your pants and your boss is like, hey, I know that he's been playing around with some kitty games and in his spare time. So don't do it, okay? Our review team will catch these things. We've actually made it a lot easier to, to do this in Jelly Bean, but unfortunately, our review team will still test on those older devices, so you better make it work everywhere. So again, this is a document that's right online. I'm just going through the document and pointing out important things to note. Strict mode is cool. You should test with it. Our testers will test with it, okay? Make sure there aren't big red flashes conspicuously throughout your game, okay? It means that there's a chance that you're, you're causing the UI thread to block. It means that someone's not gonna be able to hit a button and have it be responsive in the middle of your game. It sucks, you know? You, you don't want that, okay? Finally, um, your app needs to provide high quality graphics for different form factors, yep. okay? This is important because it turns out that the devices that our review team is most likely to be testing against are these guys. And they have three different form factors, three different sizes, and it turns out if you target these three sizes, you actually are going to get just about every important device that people are spending money on on Google Play in terms, in terms of coverage. So these are three very important classes of devices, and if you don't have all three of these, you're gonna have to explain why your game can't run on all three of them. So an example would be on, on, on Nexus 10, okay? It is a high DPI device, okay? A lot of older tablets weren't. So if your text is microscopic and difficult to read and your buttons require hands that are meant for an elf, you probably have to, to go and think about how you're scaling. All right, and of course, if you wanna get featured, you better think about your assets. And I'm, not, I'm talking about the artwork that goes along with your game. Now, we've changed things a lot in Google Play, okay? We're, and we'll go over that in slightly more detail. But the important thing is that you need to have a really great large icon because icons are always important. They're always the most important representation of your brand within the device and within Google Play. But now they're more important because now they're the only representation in many versions of the Play Store. So for example, you know, this icon here, great. It says, I'm gonna be throwing paper into a bucket. I get exactly what's going on. It's cool, right? And that's the way it appears on a tablet. And you can put a lot of stuff into these large icons. I mean, look, I've got a brand, I've got a name, I know exactly what's going on here. So there's, you, you actually can get quite creative with it. It's a little different than what you were saying a year ago. But the best part about all of these guidelines is in addition to the guidelines themselves, we also give you an actual test suite that you can go and hand to your QA team. Okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me just, you know, it's not just make sure your app does this, but it's a set of steps to actually go and verify that your app is really doing the right thing. You know, rotate your device this way, click here, click the home button, check for this state. You can actually hand that to your QA team. It is actually what our QA team does when we look at every single featured application that goes into Google Play. So remember. So where was that again, Dan? Uh, mind everyone. <laughs> oh, yes, that's a good point. Here, wait. Why don't you say it? It'll have uh, more punch if you say it. Sure. So, like, so remember, it's developer.android.com. You go to distribute and then app quality. And let me repeat this. You should definitely hand this to your QA team or check this because this will definitely increase your probability that our teams will be like, hey, this is an awesome game. We should probably take a look. And the fact that you've actually listened to us and implemented this in your game makes us feel really good about ourselves. Yeah, well, well more importantly, it, makes, it, gives us, it means we have a lot less work to do. Right. Because if you don't implement this and we love your game, okay, we're going to have to come back to you and we're going to say, you have to change this and this and this and this. And then, then, you'll, then you'll say, well, I don't really want to change that, but okay. And then we'll know you didn't get to that one. And then all of a sudden, a month has passed and you realize you could have been featured a month earlier had you right. just done this stuff to begin with. So please, look at this stuff. It's great and we're going to keep updating it. 
All right. So, assuming Le that you have. We're not at level two. Right, we're not in level two, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was all level one, guys. <laughs> so. so, now we're in level two. Now you got, you know, like Dan said, he covered all the things you should be looking at for your core app quality guidelines, such as back button navigation, um, some of the SDKs, and all that stuff. So, let's talk about doing all of that. That seems like probably a lot of work. So, really, why should you care? Um, ultimately, it's about getting kind of featured and promoted within the Google Play Store. And I mean, it is a lot of work, but I'm sure you I guys mean, are like... I mean, our editorial teams, right? I mean, they, they, they you know, actual people. Yes, go actual and people. Look, go and look at your game. They're, they're not robots. They, I mean, like, you know, Google is kind of magical in one sense, but, you know, our, our store is not curated by robots. No, not yet. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> Soon, maybe. <laughs> I'm waiting for that, waiting for that Star Trek <laughs> computer. Anyway, so... Why should you care? Because yes, our merchandising team does look at all these games on a weekly basis, and we have them all over the world. Remember, we're a global market, so there's games that can be promoted and featured all over the place. So what does that mean? So like getting featured it is actually a power boost for your game. So let's take an example of one game that was released recently. They were launched on day one. Um, they're, you know, it's pretty good, 500,000. Installed. That's, like, that's, that's, that's not bad. Solid, like for no, you know, organic growth. Like that's where we all want to go. But look what happens when it gets featured, right? Day five. Remember, one week is a featuring period. Um, they went from 500k to almost three million by the end of that week. Yeah, and, and remember, the, the game developer did the most important thing to begin with. This was a game that was very highly rated to begin with on Google Play. So when 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 we actually did the featuring period, it just powered up their game. If a game is like looking bad and going downhill in terms of yeah. the ratings and we feature it, this is not what yeah. happens. So this is about an app having great quality and in addition right. getting a boost through featuring. Right. Featuring doesn't help bad games. Yeah. That's no, why not at all. It not just all. it makes it worse. It <laughs> right. means it <laughs> don't actually your ratings will probably take a nosedive and that, bad. from which you will never recover. Right. So yeah, so it's very important that, that the game is awesome. So that's part of the reason we we really put so much time and effort into making sure mm -hmm. users will like it. So let's talk about some other developers and their experiences on getting featured on Google Play and why it's important. And so this is a developer anonymous. He said, you know, downloads and installs increase 10 to 20x. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, some of you, I don't know how many of you played Super Hexagon. <sighs> yeah, probably the hardest game alive. I love hard games, by the way. Yeah, it's anyway, their sales the of their game has increased by 4x during feature week. And I'm sure a lot of you have known Sword and Sorcery, hopefully. I'm sure we're all game developers here. Yeah, right? Yeah, Maybe. Yeah. Okay. But... So they've been on sale for four months. During feature week, 55% of revenue was made during the feature week, which is a little scary, actually. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure that's a message I want to <laughs> I send know. to developers. I don't know if it's like a message, but I mean, it drives them to think. Yeah. Getting, getting noticed there, by us is going to really, really help yeah. the, your game. Your I mean, I think, I think when you see that number, you say, all right, perhaps there are things outside of being features the developer needed to do, because clearly the game was awesome, right. monetized really, really well, but it, you know, it just wasn't getting eyeballs. Right. So, it's like, so point proven, it's pretty important. But, you know, after you get featured, now what, right? Actually, featuring is only the beginning, right? I mean, there's, once you get featured, it's kind of that first step that opens doors to a lot of many other, like, promotions. Um, we've talked about Editor's Choice that gets updated on a quarterly basis. Talk about, you know, some of the top developer badges. But how do I get to that point? I'm sure many of you are wondering about that. So I'm going to let Dan talk about that on how other how you can actually use Google to kind of increase and kind of like level up your distribution. All right. So um, we made a little announcement a few hours ago, and I've already talked about it a little bit in, in another talk. But let me just go over in case you missed it. Okay, we have now launched Play Games Platform Services, which is great because we now have a system for leaderboards and achievements and real-time multiplayer and cloud save and, and even an anti-piracy feature, which I'm really excited about. Um, so, that, so that games that are premium titles, that are paid titles on Google Play, can actually disable key features to people who are not registered as users of that game. So it's something we think is really important. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times people think, "All right, we're 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 actually leaning everything towards non-premium content." Actually, we really want to we really want to help premium content be successful. So we've, that's made it a very important launch portion of Play Games Platform Services. But this is only the beginning because Play Games Platform Services is actually part of Google Plus, and so it's got it's got simple authentication. 
which is great because people actually prefer to log in through Google Plus than through a lot of other means, especially when they're playing games, as it turns out, uh, and interactive posts and app activities. Now, I'm not going to go through an entire lecture on all the ways you can plusify your game, but the coolest thing, I think, is interactive posts, so that's what I'm going to talk about. So when you actually log in to play game services, you get for free a Google Plus, uh, a Go a Google Plus uh, enabled scope, which means you can automatically start calling the Google Plus APIs. And this is what it can look like. So here is our awesome game, Nostalgic <laughs> Racer. This is a real game. We actually use this internally to test the APIs. And someday, hopefully, we'll release it to all of you because it's awesome. And it's, you see it's got a G Plus sign in button. And you can use our graphics. You know, Once again, we have a whole bunch of guidelines for how you might integrate this with your game. And then we get this nice permission dialog, which has tons and tons of stuff about what you're sharing. It allows you to say, I don't want the game to know who my friends are, or I only want the game to know who certain friends are, and then I only want certain friends of mine to know that I'm playing the game, all sitting there. But then, even better, we uh, can create interactive posts. And these are really, really cool. Because right now, I've added a button in my game saying, challenge me, OK? And it has already gone and looked at my circles and said, hey, these are the guys who have the most affinity with. It's actually populated my circles for me, these, this, this particular post for me, knowing that these are the people that I'm most likely to be challenging. And it's created a call to action with this really, really cool challenge button. So it's targeted sharing, and it's got notification. But this is, this is sounding very salesy, but it's really cool. It's I really like this cool. stuff. Yeah, I know. Notice, so, he didn't, notice he didn't challenge me, because he's afraid I'd be. <laughs> yeah, no way. I'm, I'm, I'm challenging Todd, although he's really good at the game, because he actually wrote, he wrote an entire version of it. So I, I, I'm probably going to lose. But And actually, Bruno will complete. Well, I don't know. All right. So in any case, this is what they end up getting if they're in mobile. So they end up getting this, this fabulous challenge right with a call to action. If the game isn't installed, it'll say it'll allow them to install the game right away. Okay? All, it can either bring them to the store or it can bring them straight to the, straight to the game. And this doesn't just show up on their mobile device. This shows up on every Google property that contains a Google bar right there in that box in the corner. So this is a very, very pervasive notification, which is why it's an interactive post. The user actually has to decide they're going to send this. And we have a lot of other verbs other than challenge. Challenge is one of the things we support. We support things like gifting. And these are fully interactive. So it cannot just take you back to launching the game, but it actually can contain data that can take you to launch exactly into the point of the game that you want, or actually contain metadata that could allow you to properly gift something to someone. So this is something that's cool. It's on top of all the stuff we've already done. So remember, it takes you directly to the game, or it takes you directly to install. So we think this can be a great way of helping to drive installs. All right, now if we play services, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in YouTube. And if you haven't already seen it, there's a really, really cool session about YouTube uh, here at, uh, and games here at Google I.O. So you should definitely look it up on the, live st on the, on the streaming site. So a lot of you are already using, taking advantage of YouTube for your market listings, which is cool. Everyone should have video in their market listings for a lot of reasons. One is it turns out gamers really like video. In these rather old statistics, we can see that, that, that gamers actually found out when they were looking to buy a game, watching gameplay videos was the number one way they said that they were actually looking to buy games. Watching trailers is number two. And then all these other things that people spent an enormous amount of time working on are actually much lower. So, ga so gameplay video is really important. And one of the cool things we've now released are ways in which you can actually share video directly from your game, actual gameplay video. So we actually have an API now for game video uploads and playback. Again, you should really look at the YouTube stuff. It's very, very cool. You can see this is a game that was built with Unity that actually allows you to upload 3D graphics from within the game straight to YouTube. Very, very slick, and all the source code, I believe, is all going to be published for that if it's not already. So think about using the YouTube APIs, OK? This costs you nothing, OK? Data uploads, OK? There's a Landroid client library. It allows you to make very large video uploads to YouTube. And of course, the Android Player API. Because realistically, we know that when you download a game from Google Play, the larger the game is, the fewer downloads you're going to get. That's just reality. These guys, they're all on constrained networks. They have phones with limited storage. So why put in an enormous
this video at the beginning of your game that's instead of just streaming it from YouTube. So not only can you have the game on YouTube, so every time someone plays the video within your game, you actually get a play within YouTube, which is kind of cool, but you don't actually have to download that video. They're only going to want to watch once. There was, a, there was a company who did this years and years ago that made a game about foul that were angry. And very few developers have actually followed them, but it's a really, really good tactic. And strangely enough, a lot of developers would love to be as successful as they've been. So there's a lot of more stuff to talk about this. It's at youtube.com slash dev. Look into it. It's very, very cool. There's tons of other Google APIs you might want to take advantage of, like even Hangouts APIs and plus one buttons. There's, you can actually do install from the web if you're using plus APIs. It's very, very cool. And I encourage you to look at all of it at developers.google.com. All right. So the important part. <laughs> Level three. <laughs> we made it to the first two. Yes, made it to the first two. So it's all about making them pay. Oh, I think actually I'm doing this right. I think yes. you're doing I'm, this anyway. Yeah, so, so, but money is important. So one of the questions we often get from developers is, how do I make money on Android games? I mean, if you're a developer, you probably wish there was an easy command to do that. But the truth is, it's not that simple. To help. We've introduced in-app billing v3, which is a much easier to implement and more reliable, well, I should say, it's easier to implement reliably. Let's make that clear. So here's the basic idea. In the old version of in-app billing, you actually had to maintain a state machine, um, which you had to maintain across a, a, uh, a broadcast receiver and a service and your activity. And if you're using like, some game engines, oftentimes that service was actually running something that wasn't running your game engine. So you had to then provide logic to connect everything back. And if you were doing managed items, let's say you had a premium mode of your game you were selling, then you also had to provide a database to store all those managed items. And you probably encrypted that because you're trying to be really careful about making sure that people can't just yeah. easily you know, hack into that. And, and all of these things are things every developer had to do. But in Billing V3, we've actually simplified a lot of these things. So you, for example, say, I want to buy 100 elf berries. Elf berries? Yeah. Really? <laughs> hey, it's, it's fun. They're blue. Uh, <laughs> and, and Google Play responds with something like, OK. OK, it's a synchronous API. Mm -hmm. it, it's much, much easier for people to implement. Secondly, we now have local item pricing. OK, this is something we should have had from the beginning. But we have it now. And it's really, really awesome because you now can actually tell your users how much you're going to charge for an item before they actually go to the Play Store. You can have your entire catalog sitting there with all the actual prices that they're actually going to get charged before you actually have to go. It's really, really cool, right? And no, it's cool because it's actually important because, you know, people, you know, doesn't revolve around America, kind of, you know, like, so. You take 99 cents, right? If you look at Korea or Japan or Asia, it comes out as this weird number, like 1,058 yeah. one. And like. you should definitely know what that number is if you're going <laughs> right. to have it in your game. And, if, and you should, you know, of course, fix it if, if it is a strange number. Another thing in V3, as I mentioned, is restoring purchases is really, really cheap. So it used to be in the old days, the only way you could possibly deal with a premium item would be to actually store it along with your game's database. Now with V3, you can query Google Play as often as you like. Uh, and that's great, because one of the most natural times you'd want to do that is when you launch the game, or when you come back to the game. And this also allows you to keep track very, very easily of where Google Play's state is. So if they even went on another device, purchased premium content, you can immediately sync that up to your device. We actually go through and sync all of that stuff in the background across all of your devices so you don't have to. And of course, as I mentioned before, it's easier to implement correctly. And this is, here, here's the point, when a customer decides to put their trust in you as the game developer and in us as Google, this is an incredibly important singular moment because you have something very, very valuable. It's not the 99 cents or percentage of 99 cents that you're about to get. It's their trust. They gave you their physical money and they expect to get something in return. I mean, nothing is more valuable to a developer than your reputation at this point. So imagine, imagine if at that magical moment, you take the user's money and lose the purchase. OK, let me reiterate this, because this may not be clear, OK? You've taken the user's money, and they've lost the purchase. Now, what does this mean, OK? OK, this is not something you want to do and we work very, very hard 
and then at building v3 to make sure you don't do that. So, you, and also as we roll out new features for developers, we're gonna be rolling all of them out around in at building v3. So it's very, very important that you consider using it. What we've seen from developers already is people who have switched to in-app billing v3 have seen fewer problems with customer service, fewer cancellations. It is, it is absolutely working. So please, 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 there is a session that has been recorded here at Google I.O. Unfortunately, it is at the same time as this one. Otherwise, I would tell you to go see it, that you should definitely go and look up on the stream. It is, gonna, it is a fantastic session, and it includes this joke. So. <laughs> So, we're gonna talk about other ways that you can make money on Google Play besides like virtual coins and magic swords and all this other stuff, is that subscriptions. Now wait. Well, you can use subscriptions to buy virtual coins and magic swords. Sure. Okay, I just wanna make but that clear. I'm just saying like, instead of it being a one-time purchase, right, what if this user is like, hey, like, I actually wanna keep this item. Like, usually most, you know, items are like, you know, they only last a day, right, those experience boosters. Now, what if you can get a user to be like, hey, I wanna get this experience, this 50% experience booster till end of time. Well, that's what, that's where you can use subscriptions as part of your in-app purchases. So, they can actually make a big difference when done well. And so, we actually had a game developer, Glue Mobile, that has implemented this within Interni Warriors 2. Now, if you see, what was very interesting is, let's say, subscription is in blue, in-app purchase, just like buying items individually is in red. So see, like subscription revenue is actually making more revenue than their in-app purchases. So I'm not saying you should do this to every one of your games. It obviously matters. You gotta look at your game, make sure it's the right thing. But I mean, it is also a viable way to kind of increase, yeah. like can, in, not even increase, but at least continue and maintain that custom relationship you have with your user. Because once they open that wallet, that's actually very, very important. Like, it doesn't happen that often, and, so. And another thing to consider, I mean, a lot, a lot of the, the complaints that people say about free-to-play games is that they don't feel like they're getting enough value for purchases, and subscriptions is a way to kind of close that gap. For the person who is a, who is a hardcore player who, who knows they're gonna be playing this game a lot in the next couple of weeks, months, years, you can actually provide them ways and saying, look, here's a way in which you can, you can, we can give you extra value for your money in the game. And so I think, I think it's actually a very powerful thing for people who would normally be buying premium games, but now we're actually looking at, at things that are freemium. So there's other ways to think about it. Let's also talk about other things, other payment options. So we, as many of you already know, we offer direct carrier, direct carrier billing to a lot of our users. I mean, they cover nearly 50% of our, um, our user base, which is great, right? You see all these carriers, they all have direct carrier billing implemented within their game. And obviously, we're trying to expand more as we go. So if you're interested on in what the update on that is, you can also go to this talk on making money in Google Play, which is tomorrow. So. But then we also have gift cards. And yes, gift cards are only available in certain countries. I'm sorry, we're trying to expand it. There's many other countries that would like gift cards because not everyone in the world has a credit card, right? Or direct carrier billing. So we're working on it, um, but it's just to know that there are many options available to users because we care. Users like to pay for things in different ways. Sometimes they can't just like. We like to help users pay. Yeah. We do. Um, so, all right. It <laughs> makes your job easier. So, <laughs> level four. Global empires. So how many of you have traveled from outside the United States, you know, San Francisco? To get, to get here. To get here. See, a very significant portion of you, like wow. Asia, Europe, one's kind of. This is a really big room, by the way. Yes. If you're watching this on the stream or, you know, this is. <laughs> and of course, everyone that's watching our live stream right now, right? Clearly, like, there's probably a good portion of them from abroad who's not been able to think. Well, what's great is Android is big all over the world, right? And also we're available in 130, Google Play is available in 130 countries. So you should probably be doing business with all of this. Um, let's see, next slide. So I'm actually living in, I'm living in Korea right now. I'm kind of doing some games work well, while in Korea and also kind of doing this. I'll say you're here now. But yes, yeah. I'm here now, obviously, but I'm visiting. <laughs> but in this case, actually, I was in uh, G-Star, which is kind of this large video game conference in Korea about in November 2012. And, you know, like, the way to think about it is, is you know, 100,000 people, all gamers, kind of, like, checking out what's new. What was actually really incredible is that on the show floor, 80%, like, literally 80%, like, there were some random consoles that were still there, but 80% of the floor was covered with mobile games. Like, this is, like, and, you know, and what are most of those games being played on? Like, what devices? Well, I mean, as you probably have figured out, it's Android, Android devices. And what's great is because of this, Google Play is actually growing faster than devices activated. I don't need to remind you, it's the 48 billion installs, and a lot of that is actually games. And so that's great for your business. It's a huge opportunity, right? So what are we talking about? So it's like 
the, probably like this, this, this point last year, like, you know, we didn't really talk about how you can make money abroad or all this stuff. But I mean, this is probably the time to think about how to expand beyond, beyond your own market. So for one thing is that, um, you know, I was talking to my Korean cousin about like, you know, a certain game and she was just, she was telling me, she's like, Nuna, 저기, 이 게임 영어만 돼 있어요? 그 한국 버전 있으면 저, 저, 저 좋겠는데요? So, um, you probably don't understand that, but it's Korean. They were kind of complaining the game was only in English and they'd like to play it in Korean if it was available or asking me if I knew the developer was going to launch in Korean. So what does that mean? You actually have a larger fan base that could be out there. And especially since some of our fastest growing markets are in Asia specifically, especially Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, like you probably should start thinking about how I should take my game kind of globally or outside my borders. So let's take an example of Gun, Brother, Gun Bros 2, which is like, you know, it's a pretty, pretty neat uh, game from Glue Mobile. I mean, this is kind of like what their page looks like from, you know, in the US or any English speaking territory, right? So in January, we actually launched um, the ability for you to upload localized assets, to, like screenshots. So like screenshots, graphics, icons, and banners, and you can change them by region. So what does this mean? Glue decided to create a Korean version of their game. Oh, now it looks like I'm going to blow things up in Korean. Now, imagine, like, as a Korean user, how excited you can be, because this looks pretty cool, right? Like, look, it's like, I, I all know. the titles are in Korean. That actually says Gun Bros 2 in Korean. I actually think the title in Korean looks a lot better than the English. Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Like, I, I, I want to play the Korean version more. <laughs> right. Like, there's something cooler about that. Um, so what does this mean? Well, if, the, if your user can understand what this game is and what it's about, it's probably more likely they're gonna actually download and install the game. Probably. So is it really worth it, right? I mean, that's a lot, a lot of languages. I would say, I would say probably, I think it's incredibly more likely. Right, right? Well, probably <laughs> incredibly more likely, right? And so like how much more likely? Like, well, let's talk about this, right? So we're talking about two launches um, from Glue Mobile. Like, so they've actually launched two games. One was Eternity Warriors 2, and also the next game was Blood and Glory Legend. They were actually like only a week apart. They were launched in like about August 2012. So the only difference is that Eternity Warriors 2 was actually localized in Korean at launch. Meanwhile, Blood and Glory Legend 2 was only available in, you know. The like, icons almost look, I mean, in English. All, like, like, you, like you can't even tell which game is going, is going, is all that different from the other. Because, you know, one, there's one, I guess they wear armor and the other one they've got glowing Has eyes. Has glowing eyes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right. pretty close, okay. So, like, so, so what is it? So let's, let's check out what happened. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Tale 2 launches. So let's talk about Glue Mobile downloads. Eternity Warriors 2 is one in blue, and the Blood and Glory Legend is red. This is for Korea. So you can notice that the downloads for a game, because the game was localized in Korean, was significantly higher than the Blood and Glory Legend. Is that actually it, it's installed? Like, it's maybe? like, it's, th th those are downloads. Those are, that's like flatlining there. That's, that's incredible. Um, so. But yeah, you know, downloads are great, right? Like, it doesn't this, matter is this, if they is don't this, pay. Is this in, in Korea then? Or is it we're This talking? is just in Korea. Just in Korea, okay. In I'm like, Korea. I, hope, I hope they got a few downloads in the rest of the world at least. Oh, uh, yes, okay. I'm sure they did in okay. other English speaking territories. But okay. I mean, the thing is, you can get downloads, right? That's great. But will these users actually pay? Well, let's look at the revenue. Yep, uh, yeah, so yeah, these users will pay if the game is actually in their local language. So wait, so, so more users and happy users means more revenue. Yes. That, that, that sounds like something we said earlier. Right, not so secret formula, guys. You always gotta think about your user, right? So in Korea, it doesn't matter if they're in Korea, Japan, Russia, Brazil. I mean, if, I mean it's always nice to have their game in their local language because then they can actually enjoy it more. It's all about the user, that's what we're here for, so. Absolutely. All right. Let's let's see. So let's talk about another developer, right? You've probably heard enough about Glue. We don't really care anymore. Give me, give me, tell me about some other developers. So let's talk about GameLoft, right? So like you know, they've been enjoying the whole like, uh, yeah, like mobile game revenue. We're making lots of money, 190 percent year over year growth. By the way, data is not really reflective, don't even, but just to show you percentages. Now they started localizing in Korean, right? And so this is what happened. Korea all of a sudden is like increased to 520 percent just because they started localizing in Korean, which is now, and now the Korean market is actually one of their fastest growing markets by revenue within their portfolio. So is it, and like, this is not just Gameloft either, right? I mean, we have publishers, we have publishers like EA that's seeing very similar revenue growth lifts, about like 30% or even higher for some territories that don't have English speaking, that are not, don't have enough English speakers. And of tons of my other developers as well have noted that, you know, they're just seeing a lot higher revenue lift, especially in those markets, just for being in Korean, Japanese, or all those. So what does this mean? Well, 
you shouldn't simply, so localization does not equal translation. Let me make that clear. Um, localization does not equal translation. So what does that mean? Well, you can do translated strings, right? That's awesome, but you really gotta think about your game, right? Each market is different, each user is different. They're gonna be used to like many different ways of paying. They're gonna be different, used to different yeah. ways of like yeah. gameplay, leveling yeah. up. And not every game should be localized. Look, I mean, if you're, if you're gonna be talking about um, the great American sport of football, you know, you should figure out which countries are actually going to like right. that. You know, that's it. But, but certainly there's a lot of things that will translate very, very well to a global audience. And that's what we're seeing, is that, is that when developers take the time to actually make their game work for a global audience, they get paid back in spades. Right. All right, we're gonna move quickly. We're almost we're gonna out move of time quickly. here. Sorry, we moving really quickly. So, <laughs> but if you wanna find out more, we're gonna talk about Korea. We have a talk about, well, we'll show it later, but we have also have an awesome we're talk about building Android apps for a global audience tomorrow and play Office Hours talk on Korean Japan Friday afternoon. We get to see more Co. For me, all right, <laughs> so next. Quickly, quickly. The bonus, bonus round. round. All right, so how many of you have visited our arcade out there that we have out in the in the sandbox? Like four of you. Come on, some of you must be game developers. All right, all right, a few more. Um, so we've talked a lot about about game controllers in the past. We added support for standard HID controllers in a honeycomb, and it's been gratifying to see a lot of games having some limited support for them. But here's the problem. Okay, I'm a gamer. I've gotten Nostalgia Creation, which of course is my favorite test game that we use to build Google Play game services. And I was excited to see that it had support for Nostalgia Controller. Woo! and so make these game gamers like be happy. Okay, what, what this means is that you should actually make sure you're using defaults for all of these things in your menus, especially the action button, because we kind of screwed up, and I'll go into a little detail about that. So here's a generic controller. This looks like a controller from any number of consoles, as in fact, as it turns out, if you plug an OEM Xbox or OEM PS3 controller into an Android device, it actually maps almost exactly like this. Not every third-party controller will work this way, because these are actually done using Linux drivers that are being contributed from, from the community. So, we actually will map both the Axis hat, which is actually an analog access for some bizarre reason in HID, and Axis X and Axis Y into D-pad events for you, which is really, really cool. <coughs> we also map the X and Y into D-pad center, which is really cool as well. And we map A and B both to the back button, which kind of sucks because no one really thinks the A button should go back, not even us. So, right. so, so what you should really do is make sure that if you are gonna bother handling these things, make sure to handle the A button explicitly. That's all this entire slide was about. All right, other common buttons. Make them do things. All right, now, other common buttons. Make them do things too. And here's, here's the final thing I wanted to say. You also probably want to handle analog input, a lot of you, because it's really important. A lot of these games are designed around touch screens. Analog input is important. So we have analog axes, okay? As it turns out, most of these axes are gonna look like this. You actually have to be a little bit careful when you're handling the two front triggers because they're going to come in on most devices and that's also hat switch. Let me explain this quickly. So if you're handling analog axes and you, and, and, and this means that you, and you want to handle D-pad events, you actually have to make sure you handle both D-pad events and handle the hat switch because what we end up doing is bundling motion events together. And if you say that you're handling all of them, we'll never generate D-pad events for you anymore because we're like, oh, the game's got it. We don't need to dem dem you know, do those legacy events for it. So if you want to handle D-pad, you also have to handle hat switch. And uh, one more thing to note on this is that if you're handling the triggers, you actually need to make sure you're handling both R trigger, R trigger and throttle and L trigger and brake. They will almost always be the same thing um, because it turns out that most of the drivers in the Linux kernel actually map everything to throttle and brake no matter what the device sends out. And as it turns out, the HID spec mostly sends out throttle and brake. So unless you have an Xbox controller today with the current versions, you're actually not gonna get L trigger and R trigger. Um, or a shield device, I think we'll do the same thing. Uh, but throttle and brake uh, are, are things you wanna handle together. So think of these as being synonymous for now. Um, at least your default should handle them that way. All right, that was a lot of information in a very short time. But there's a lot of sessions of interest you should see here. While you're here at Google I.O., these are things that haven't happened yet. So we have Android as seen on TV, which is gonna have some awesome news for game developers. We're gonna have? Building apps for a global audience. What? Yeah, exactly. And like where they're going to talk about some of the APIs, some of the new features that was announced in Keynote and how you can implement that within your application or game. What's new for devs in Google Play, which has got some super exciting stuff going on, as well as... Get getting discovered on Google Play, which I actually highly recommend going to because it talks about how like that entire magic box works within <laughs> Finally, <laughs> uh, making money on Google Play and then make your game more social code lab, which is a code lab where you can either bring your own game or you can actually use our game and implement Google Play services in your game. And that is it. Thank that is you it. very Thank much. Thank you very much. So